Hey, Ben, I don't know if the, is it done? Oh, okay, oh, there's no light. All right. Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. So it's always good to be here. Um, before we start, let's just start with a word of prayer. Let's just bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask that you uh, come and join us today as we uh, worship and uh, spend time in your word. And we just ask that um, you just uh, give me the words that you want me to speak. Let me be the mouthpiece of your living word, Lord, and uh, speak to everyone's heart in the way that they need to hear uh, for this message can reach out to everyone in different ways. And so we just ask that you uh, just uh, touch their hearts in the way that they need the most. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, you know, I was um, trying to think, you know, what I wanted to preach on. And, you know, I, I'm, my most favorite thing to preach on is prophecy. And especially right now, because, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now that's fulfilling prophecy. It's really, really exciting. Um, but the thing is, we need to be careful because we can preach prophecy day and, uh, day and night, and, but if we don't have that relationship with Christ, it really doesn't mean anything. Amen. So today I'm, I'm going to kind of hold off. There's a lot of stuff that's been happening just in the past week or so, um, but I'm going to hold off on that right now because there's some important matters that we need to really focus on, um, and that's our heart, the heart issues. Um, but there's some confusion, you know, with us living in these last days, and so I want to clear some of that up here. Because as Seventh-day Adventists, you know, we are excited, you know, when, you know, knowing that we are living in the last days, and we look forward to longing in with, with eagerness and enthusiasm at the advent of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, it's very easy to get a strong amen with pretty much any Adventist congregation. When you say something like, you know, Jesus is coming very, very soon, get an amen. Um, but Ellen White, she says something interesting. Um, she says this. She says, when the shortness of time is urged as incentive for reformation, that it savors of selfishness. She says that that's not the great motivator. So let, let me repeat that one more time. She says, when the shortness of time is urged as incentive for reformation. So let me ask, are we running out of time here? Yes. Yep. We don't know how long, but we know that time is coming to a close. And she said a lot of times that is urged as incentive for reformation, for reforming, going back to the Bible foundations, getting right with God. But she says that that savors of selfishness. She says it's not the great motivator. So let me translate that for you. Now, we are to be an urgent people, but the question is, what is the source of our urgency? Now, many of us would answer that question in this way. We would say, well, Jesus is coming very soon. The signs of the times are being fulfilled. We're seeing prophecy being fulfilled. Um, and there's no time to be playing games with God. We, we hear preachers and pastors saying that all the time. Jesus is coming soon. No time for playing games with God. Or, you know, we might hear, Jesus is coming soon. It's time to get your life in the, in the right order. You know, I mean, how many of you have, have heard that? But Ellen White says that that's not the great motivator. She says, when the shortness of time is urged as incentive of reformation, that it savors of selfishness. So that raises the question, then, if we are called to be a people of urgency, then what should be our source of our urgency? And so... The message of the sermon is, why not tomorrow? And so no one in this room likes to think more than I that Jesus is coming very soon. I mean, it's very clear. And, you know, lately, you know, I've, I've been keeping a close eye on, you know, the prophecies that have been fulfilled. I've been watching, you know, what Donald Trump is doing, what Pope Francis is doing, what just the whole entire world stuff that's going on. And seeing like the forest fires in California, you thought they were done and then they start up again. You're seeing these earthquakes, you're seeing these killings, just morality is coming to an all-time low. And so, you know, it's important for us to look at these and we should have our eyes on these various topics um, so that we're aware of the times that we're living in. But there's a danger if we tie our urgency to what Rome is doing to what Trump is doing, to what the United, what the United Nations is doing. Um, 
there's a danger where we can create a type of what's called a complacency. And so a complacency goes something like this. You know, we're going to be waiting. We're going to be watching. We're going to be watching Fox News, CNN, reading USA Today, you know, seeing stuff on, on the internet. And we're going to be watching to see what happens. And, you know, we, we've all read the book. We all know what happens. We know how it's going to end. And so when we begin to see these things happening, we say, okay, all right, here it is. Let's get ready. Things are happening. But when we begin to be seeing these things happening, we go, okay, what do I need to do? What should I be doing? You know, I, I've, I'm even guilty of that. I, I asked myself, I was just talking to uh, Pastor Jerry about this the other day. What, what do we do? You know, because I mean, Sunday laws are just right around the corner. But is what the president is doing and what the United Nations is doing and Pope Francis is doing, are these the things that we should be looking for for the sources of our urgency? The answer is no. And I'll explain. Because there is a danger that we will begin to look and say that, hey, you know what? Things look all right right now. And we know that the Bible says that right before the end, it says they are going to speak peace and safety, but then sudden destruction is going to come upon them. And so... We need to be careful and when, because there's going to be a time of peace. Things are going to seem all right. You know, it's going to seem like we have a time of prosperity. But that urgency will be taught to our own perception of what is going on in the world around us. And that's what's going to be dangerous. There's a far greater reason of urgency, and I want to talk to you about that today. Now, we are Seventh-day Adventists, and yes, we are a people of urgency. And yes, we believe that Jesus is coming very soon. But we're going to find something very, something very interesting. Scripture is saturated and covered with urgency. You know, we can look in the book of Genesis, and we see that there's a call for urgency. We can look all throughout the Old Testament, and we see urgency, and all throughout the New Testament. And it says, don't wait, don't hesitate, don't put it off, do it today, do it now. But we're going to notice something very interesting as we look at a couple passages here. We're going to see that none of these urgencies in the scriptures are tied to the second coming of Christ. And so for our first passage, we're going to go to our scripture reading. And we're going to go to Joshua 24 and verse 15. So turn with me to Joshua 24 and verse 15. Verse 15, it says, And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So what Joshua is doing here is he's gathering all the people into the valley of Shechem, and he's, he begins to recite this marvelous sermon. And in the context of the sermon, as he's drawing it to a close, he makes an appeal, which is what we're going to be making today. We're going to be making an appeal. And his, and his appeal was, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. And then he ends, he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, the people respond by saying, you know, okay, yes, we're going to serve the Lord. And then Joshua, you know, he goes on and you can see this in here. And he says, no, 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 you, you can't serve the Lord. And they say, yes, we can. Yes, we can. And they keep going back and forth like that. And so they just keep going back and forth. And they notice what it says in verse 25. In verse 25, it says, so Joshua made a covenant with the people that day. He said, okay, you say you're going to serve the Lord. So we're going to make a covenant. We're going to make this official. And made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Now, when did he make that covenant? Did he make it next week, next month? No, he made a covenant with the people that very day and made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Now, jump down to verse 29, where it says, Now it came to pass after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. So Joshua doesn't just, you know, he doesn't just sit there and say, Okay, you know what, just... Think about it, mow it over, you know, see how you feel about it, weigh the pros, weigh the cons, and then, hey, then get back with me. No. He says, choose for yourselves when? Today. 
Okay. And so when people choose positively that they will follow the Lord, the Bible says that he made a covenant with them right there and right then. And so there's this, this sense of urgency for Joshua because according to the passages of Scripture, there's no sense that there's any great expanse of time from verse 25 to 29. Okay? And so Joshua then dies. And so we're going to ask a very simple question. Was there urgency in Joshua's appeal? Yes, there was urgency. He was saying, choose for yourselves today. He didn't want people to, to wait. He wanted them to make a decision right now. So let's put together a little timeline. And so we think about Joshua was about 1,400 years before the very first advent of Christ, when Christ came to earth the first time. Um, and, then, you know, and then we see that you know, we're here in 2017, almost 2018, so we're... 2,000 years, I mean, that's about almost, what, three, four, 4,000 years after Joshua. And so Joshua is, you know, over a millennia away from the second return of Christ. Okay, and so there's this urgency, all right? And so for Joshua, his appeal there was not rooted in a kind of get ready because Jesus is coming soon. That, that was not the urgency there. You know, I, I heard of this bumper sticker that said, Jesus is coming soon, look busy. You know, it's, it's kind of cute you think about it, but, you know, how many of us kind of think about that? You know, we better get busy. Busy getting right with God. But that shouldn't be our source of urgency. Now, let's look at uh, another scripture. Let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 21. 1 Kings 18 verse 21. And here the word of God says, And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him, Not a word. And so when we look at this passage, we see that uh, Elijah made an appeal with everyone here also. And so he has an urgency. He says, How long are you going to, to hesitate between two opinions? Now, what's a synonym for, for hesitate? Just blurt, blurt one out. What's a synonym for hesitate? Stall. To stall. To wait. Um, for what? Pro procrastinate. Yes. Um, some other ones, uh, oh, you said, we already said wait. How long will you linger? How long will you delay? Procrastinate? Yes. So he was asking them this. So did Elijah want the people to make a decision right then? Yes, he did. But wait a minute, where is Elijah in the timeline? Elijah's going to be several hundred years before Christ comes the first time, and he also is going to be over a, a millennia before the second return. So there's urgency there also. Now let's turn to Psalm 95, 7 through 8. I just want us to, kind of, and there's many, many more passages that we could use here. We're just looking at just a very few here. Um, Psalm 95, verses 7 and 8, says, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. So here we see that the psalmist is saying that if you hear the voice of the Lord, he says, do not harden your heart. And so is there an urgency in the psalmist's appeal? Yes, there is. And so now we will turn to our final passage and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and we're going to start in verse 1. And as we, as we read this, we're going to be closing, the, closing in on the answer um, to what is the urgency here. What is the source of our urgency? Because there's a fundamental source, and it's not the nearness of Christ's return. So verse 1 says, We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So now let's just take a step back right now, and let's take a look at everything that we've read. Okay, we've noticed a sense of urgency in Joshua's appeal. 
We saw it in Ezekiel's. We saw it in the psalmist. And now we're seeing it here in Paul's also. Okay, so I just want to give you a, a glimpse of just these few verses here. And so when we go just a little ways past the Advent, we see that Paul is, has this urgency. But still he's, you know, a millennia also away from uh, the second return. So he says, today is the time of salvation. Or uh, now is the time to behold. Today is the time of salvation. So question, was Joshua urgent? Was Ezekiel urgent? Was the psalmist urgent? Was Paul urgent? And how far away do they live? Yeah, quite a ways. So then why then do we as Seventh-day Adventists find this inclination, a dangerous inclination, to tie our urgency to the nearness of Christ's return? You know, we say, oh, Jesus is returning soon. Get your life together before it's too late. Jesus is coming soon. Don't watch that. Jesus is coming soon. Don't do that. Jesus is coming soon. Fill in the blank. So there's something that you need to be paying attention to. And it's not primarily what Donald Trump is doing. It's not primarily what Pope Francis is doing. But rather, it's the person that, it, that you see in the mirror each and every morning. You need to look at yourself. That should be the source of your urgency. How could it be that Joshua was urgent, the psalmist was urgent, Elijah was urgent, and that Paul was urgent when they lived a century, a millennia away from Christ's return? Now, when I first came in, into this church, just about four years ago, everything was entirely new to me compared to you know, what I had learned or been taught in the, the other churches that I went to. You know, my, my other churches, they didn't really focus on Christ's return being like super soon, living in the, in the end days or anything like that. I mean, you know, they may have brought it up, but there wasn't like a primary focus. And so, you know, once I learned all the ropes and the terminology and everything, being in the Seventh-day Adventist church, um, I began to tie my urgency to the nearness of Christ's return. Because I saw that, you know, I understood the 2300-day prophecy, the judgment began in 1844. You know, we've been in the judgment for, you know, 150 years or so. And I was like, okay, how much longer can this go on? But see, that was the danger of me doing that. You know, when I finally got, into, when I finally got baptized in the church, I thought to myself, woohoo, I made it. <laughs> All right. You know, this, that was close. You know, and I, I first started thinking to myself, I was like, I really don't even have time to get married or, or have kids in the future. You know, someone might say, hey, you know, there's a cute girl over there or, you know, there's a cute girl on, this cute Asian girl on Facebook, and I was like, ah, you don't have time for that, but then, eh, maybe a little, little bit of time for that. And here I am married. But no, when I first got in the church, I was like, there's no time to get married. You know, so there's people here today that were certain, I'm sure there's many people here in this room that have been in this church for a long time that were certain Jesus was going to return much sooner. Let's take it a step further. There are people on the ground that thought Jesus was going to return in their lives. There's hundreds, no, thousands of people in the ground right now that are absolutely certain without a doubt that Jesus is going to return in their lifetime. And many people here today are probably thinking the exact same thing. And I'm one of those people. But we have to notice that there are thousands of people all throughout the world who are buried who thought Jesus was going to return in their lifetime. Now, I don't want anyone here to think that I'm trying to dilute the urgency here. In fact, I'm trying to increase your urgency, but I'm trying to tie that urgency to something even more important than your perception of what is going on in the world around you. So let me ask you this. Where is the Bible's true sense of urgency? Is it rooted in the nearness of Christ's return? In a sense, I mean, in a sense, it, it is. But we should always have an awareness. But there's an even greater sense of urgency, and I would like to share that with you today. So there's two ways to answer this question. The first one is that we live in a dangerous world. Do we not? Yes. I mean, you turn on the news 6 o'clock in the morning, and you can see how just crazy this world is. So we live in a world that is very scary and very dangerous and with low, like little to no morals whatsoever. And so there's a dangerous way in an almost Calvinistic way of thinking where people will think that because they're a believer that nothing bad will happen to them at all. 
For those people who think that, you might want to go read your Bible because you clearly haven't seen the stories that the followers of Christ went through, all the apostles, Jesus, you know, seeing Noah, Moses, all that. You need to see that. And we have an adversary, the devil, who is out there like a lion looking to devour us. So we need to realize that we are literally in the crosshairs of a spiritual warfare and that we are going to be going through trials. Paul says that we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but that we wrestle with spiritualities and principalities and wickedness of higher places. Now, at one point, Jesus tells his disciples, he says that he is sending them out as lambs among a pack of wolves. Now, just think what a hungry wolf wants to do to a lamb. And then he goes on and he speaks in Matthew 10, verses 17 through 19. He says, beware of men. And then he goes on to speak and he says that they will deliver you up and they will kill you. Now, Jesus never gave this easy, soft, sweet, easygoing message that, hey, you know what, everything's going to be all right now that you're a follower of me. But no, on the contrary, he says that no, nothing, things aren't going to be all right because now you are at enmity to the world. Are we together on this? Okay, so it's, you know, I mean, we, we all know this, but many of us, even though we know this, we've studied it, yet we walk around in this world like it's not a dangerous place. But the Bible presents that the world is like a war zone. No, it's not with guns and bombs. I mean, okay, we see that. But the true danger is not the guns and the bombs. It's the spiritual warfare that we need to be careful for. Because we, we should not care about our lives. Like if, if we die, that should not be our main concern. Our eternal life is what should be our primary concern. But a lot of times we put our own physical life above our eternal life. So mo for most of us, the world is not a scary enough place. We generally feel safe. You know, have you ever noticed that while you're driving down the interstate and you, know, you come across just all of the car accidents? I mean, I'm talking about the terrible car accidents where the car is so mutilated and you just know for a fact that the people in that did not survive. Have you ever noticed that you're always the one looking at the car accident, you're not in it. And it's, and it's been that way your whole entire life. You see all these devastating accidents. You're always on the outside. Why is everybody else dying? It's never you. And so this begins to give you a sense of invincibility. It might be subconscious, or you just might think, oh, I'm on top of the world, nothing bad's gonna happen to me. And so it begins to see if you're sensitive. You know, it's like, hey, these things are always happening to other people. Why aren't they happening to me? You know what's so interesting, though? That's exactly what those people thought until the crash happened. And then they're on the other side. You see, we live in a dangerous place. And think of the way that Jesus spoke when he was talking about us being as lambs being led into a pack of wolves. So our first sense of urgency is that we live in a dangerous and hostile time. We don't feel that we're in a war zone. That's dangerous thinking. And so a lot of us have, again, this Calvinistic way of thinking where they say things like, hey, you know, when it's my time, it's my time. I'll die when it's my time. But wait a minute, does the Bible actually say that? What did Solomon say, one of the wisest men in the Bible? What did he say? He said, why should you die before your time? So according to scriptures, can you die before your time, before God wants you to die? And the answer is yes. I'm just going to give you two quick examples here. We see Peter, in the uh, early uh, chapters of Acts, you see Peter was thrown into prison. Um, the church prayed for him, and so the Lord sent an angel and had released him out of prison. Okay? And then we see that Paul was in a very similar situation. He was put in prison, and the church was kind of eh, divided on his agenda, and, and they were kind of split on what they wanted to do. They didn't pray for him. And then he ended up being executed by Nero. And so, um, oh yes, and then um, in Spirit of Prophecy, I believe it's in, I, I forgot to verify this, I believe it's in Acts of the Apostles, um, where it says uh, that the Lord said that when Paul went into Nero's prison, that God wasn't done with him yet. God had plans for Paul. And so Paul tells us in the book of Romans that he is on his way to Spain and the servant of the Lord says that the church was divided about Paul's mission. 
And so Ellen White says that the church did not pray for Paul like they did for Peter. And she says that because of that, God allowed Paul to be cut short, even though he still had plans for him. And so in other words, it wasn't God's plan to have Paul's head cut off by Nero. But God had bigger and better plans for him. But we live in a very hostile and dangerous world. And so sometimes our time can be cut short. I mean, because God, I mean, he never wants us to die. But we're in this world, and so things like this are going to happen. And that's what happened when the church neglected to pray for Paul, and he ended up having his time cut short. So I want you to think that one through. The greatest missionary this world has ever seen, second to Jesus. If Paul can die prematurely, what makes you think that you can be an exception from dying prematurely? Okay? So the first reason that we need to be urgent and not tie our source of our urgency to the soon return of Jesus is that we live in a strange and hostile time, and our time can be cut short. Now, I pray this doesn't happen to anyone, but you could be going home today, and this could be your last time. Now, I, I, I pray that that does not happen to anyone, but we need to keep that in mind, and that's the urgency that we, that we see in the Bible. But there's a second reason, and I want to spend some, of, some time talking about that, and this is going to be the main focus, what I want to talk to you about today. And it was interesting... Um, that uh, Mike was talking about this, about these addictions that a lot of people are struggling through. We all have addictions of various degrees. Um, and so we, we really need to be careful about that. I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit here. Um, and so we're, we're going to look at character development and how it works. And so Ellen White says in her book on education that character building is the most important work ever entrusted to human beings and never before was its diligent study so important as now. And so let me explain to you how character development works and how it's developed. You become the person you are in a very, very simple way. And, that's, and that way is by a simple thought. Now, I'm aware you know, there's psychological situations you know, where that's, we, we won't even go there. But for the main, main, main point, you become who you are by a thought. Oops. And so once you begin to acquire a subset of habits, things that you do frequently, you now have a lifestyle. And all the word lifestyle mean is your life and style. But if you switch it around, it's the style at which you live your life. It can be good or bad. And so once you have your lifestyle, you basically have begun to form into and fast into your character. And our character becomes our destiny, who we're going to become in the future. And so we need to learn on how this works exactly. And so this way of living life is not only spoken about in the Bible in a spiritual sense, but it has been proven in the scientific world also. And so there's a wonderful quotation by a man uh, named Dr. Mario Beauregard. Uh, if you want to write this down, it, his last name is spelled B-E-A-U-R-E-G-A-R-D just beau regard. Um, and he, he wrote in, uh, in his book called The Spiritual Brain. And he says this, and this is a quote from his book, says, in recent years, however, neuroscientists have discovered that the adult brain is actually very plastic. And we'll take a look at what plastic means if you don't know. As we will see, if neural circuits receive a great deal of traffic, they will grow. If they receive little traffic, they will remain the same or shrink. The amount of traffic our neural circuits receive depends for the most part on what we choose to pay attention to. Not only can we make decisions by focusing on one idea rather than another, but we can literally change the pattern of neurons in our brains by doing so consistently. This has been demonstrated by experiments. And so your brain is literally the most complex thing known in the universe. There is nothing that even begins to approach the complexity of your brain. And so your, your brain, I'm going to kind of geek out a little bit here. I, I love this sort of stuff here. And so your brain is literally made up of billions and billions of nerves called neurons. And so off of the neurons, you, you have what are called dendrites. And then off of the dendrites, you have what are axons. And so these dendrites are literally like branches on a tree. Okay, And so they're connecting every single neuron, dendrite, axon, and they're all touching each other. And so you have what's called a dendritic or a neuronal connection. And so let me tell you something. 
Okay, I don't know how people figure this out. There's people way smarter than me, but there are cosmologists and other scientists um, that say that the number of dendritic independent connections in the human brain is in excess of the total number of atoms in the entire universe. Now, I know they didn't go and count every single atom in the universe. I don't know how they figured that out, but it's, I mean, God created the brain, so it might seem a little far-fetched, but I think that God can do anything, and we know how amazing, complex the human brain can be. Um, and so they're saying that your brain is in, by far in no comparison, doesn't even come close to being as powerful as, or there's nothing in the whole universe as powerful as our human brain. And so when you begin to think of a thought and an action, before it even becomes a habit, you have to establish a pathway in your brain through these neural connections. And so the first time that you try to do something, especially if it's something complex, that pathway is not easily formed. It's going to be difficult, okay? Such, such as, let's take for an example, riding a bike, okay? Very few people can just hop on a bike without training wheels at the age of four or five and just start pedaling and, and not falling. And so what usually happens? They fall, right? And so the little boy or the little girl gets back up on their bike and they start going again. And as they start riding again, when they feel themselves starting to tip to the left, then they correct, they go to the right, and vice versa. And so they, they start uh, correcting themselves, and over time, they're able to get it down to where they don't need the training wheels. And then they take the training wheels off the bike, and what happens? Are they still able to ride, ride the bike perfect? Nope. They're going to fall, they're going to scrape their elbows, they're going to scrape their knees. And so eventually, they're going to learn how to ride without the training wheels by trial and error. So basically what the brain is doing is this. When they fall down, their brain is telling them, okay, that's a mistake, let's do it this way this time. Okay? And so it's absolutely phenomenal what the brain is doing here. And it happens so fast and it's so incomprehensible, we, we don't realize the complexity that's going on in our brain. So the brain is compiling data of everything that we're doing, and it's saying wrong way, wrong way, wrong way. Okay, that way is the right way. And your brain remembers that. Okay, and so it's going down the path, and it says, okay, I have four choices here, let's make this one. And if it's the wrong one, you're going to fall. If it's the right one, you get to the next choice. And so then it says, okay, now which way are we going to go now? And as your brain begins to figure this out, and it, you're eventually going to learn how to ride a bike, and you are establishing a neural circuit in your brain. And eventually one day you get on that bike and you can run down a hill, you can you know, pop wheelies, do jumps, you can do all that sort of stuff. So even if you haven't ridden a bike in a number of years, you can still get on and ride a bike for the most part because you have that neural pathway, that neural connection. Now there are many more difficult things that you know, we, we can try to learn to do, um, such as trying to ride a <laughs> unicycle. Unicycle is going to be much more difficult. But my point is this. Could you learn how to ride a unicycle? <laughs> yeah, for the most part. Probably not me, but, uh, but for the most part, people, people could. And the thing is, yeah, it's going to be difficult, and it's going to take hours and hours of practice, but you see there's 5,000 wrong ways to ride a unicycle, but there's only one right way. Okay? <laughs> and so whether it's perfecting you know, a three-point shot, you know, riding a unicycle, or even how to apply Jesus into your life and you know, have an, a daily devotion, that's going to take practice. You know, Christians don't just get baptized and they have a perfect devotion life, they're reading the Bible, they, they understand things inside and out. No, it's, sanctification is the work of a lifetime. And even then, you know, we could be doing this for 70 years, and even then we aren't going to be reaching that perfection. And so as you apply that neural pathway, no matter how complex the path may be, or the task may be, it becomes easier and e easier over time. And so there's an illustration that, you know, that's just an easy way to understand it. You know, imagine I want to get from point A to point B, but to get there, I have to go through tall grass, there's brushes, there's thistles, it's, it's difficult. And so you're going through and you're pushing through here and it's so hard to get through and it, you're, you're going through, you're breaking through everything and you know, eventually you're gonna get across. But then when you look back, you see, okay, there's this path. You know, the grass is kind of stomped down. You can make out the path that you went or anything. And so you go back through again. And each time you go back and forth, 
that path is going to become easier and easier to go through. And eventually you're going to get to the point where there's just nothing there and you can just easily just you know, walk or roll, in my case, right through, no problem, super easy. And so you, you have this pathway, and that's how the brain works. Eventually, many people, you know, you, you wake up, first thing, you don't even think about it. You get on your knees, you pray, you open up your Bible, you re read it and everything. But for some people, it's not easy because they, it's, they have all this other stuff. You know, they're, they're not thinking in the sense that they need to be. And, you know, that's what we need to really think about. This is, we need to be developing the right kinds of habits. And so that's very important. And so what's really phenomenal is God has wired your brain for moral growth. It really has. But the flip side on the brain being wired for moral growth is that it can also be, Im it can be um, immoral growth also. And we can be entrenched or trapped in this immorality. And we see much of this world get into that state right now. And so your brain is technically a neurological pathway caused by making choices throughout your life and what Dr. Mario Beauregard said is what we have learned is that the adult brain is very plastic. And so what exactly does that mean, that our brain is plastic? And so we have to ask ourselves, well, what is plastic? Okay. So plastic, you know, is a, it's a modern invention, and we can literally make almost anything from plastic. We can form it into any shape. We can make it into microphone stands. We can make it into water bottles, toys, dishes. The list goes on and on on what you can shape plastic into. It's almost like clay. And so for many years, doctors and psychologists have said that when a baby is born, you have approximately seven years or so to shape and lead that child into what they're going to be for the rest of their lives. Okay, they're going to be either leaning towards nature or nurture. Has anyone heard of that? Okay, na nature or nurture. Taking psychology classes, I'm sure you've heard this. And so once they hit the age of seven, their life was pretty much set on however they were raised, that's how they were going to be in their future. But what Dr. Beauregard is saying is that the adult brain is very plastic. And it doesn't matter if you are 20, 30, 50, 40, 50 or years older, that the adult brain is very plastic. So in other words, you can still teach an old dog new tricks. And so I think that brings a lot of hope to a lot of people in here. Amen. And so the people that you are today is literally a composite of the choices that you've made over the course of your life. So when you look in the mirror today, you are not the person that you had to be, but you are the person that you chose to be. Now, you may not like the person that you are. Hopefully you do. But if you don't, it, it all comes down to choices. If you don't want to be the person you are, make different choices. And so the choices that you make today are going to make you into who you're going to be tomorrow. But what we need to realize is here's what happens when you put off an appeal. And this is what Joshua and Ezekiel and Paul and all these were talking about here. Here's what happens when you decide, maybe not today, but next time. Maybe next week at prayer meeting. Maybe next Sabbath. So the decisions that you make today are making you into the person that you will be tomorrow. And you have no guarantee that the person you are tomorrow will be capable of making, much less recognizing, the moral choices that, you've, that face you today. And so you make a choice today, and you're thinking, OK, I'm not going to make the right choice today, because I'll make the right choice in the future. I'll do it later. And so what happens is that the person in the future is not able to recognize the person from the past or the moral choices that he faces. And so how many of us, and I'm sure there's some people in here, how many of us know someone who was raised in the church, and then they made some choices in life, they did a little something you know, here and there, and then before you know it, they are so far gone, they're so far gone and completely unrecognizable from the person that you used to know. You know, it's sad, it, it, it happens. But let me tell you something, they're also unrecognizable to themselves. Because when they were still in the church and an active Christian, do you think that they would ever see themselves being where they are today? Absolutely not. And so every major habit in our life starts from just doing a little something. Just, it just takes the smallest thought, the smallest choice. So that person that you are on Tuesday is not the person that you were on Monday. And the person that you are on Wednesday is not the person that you were on Tuesday. And so you make enough bad choices in your life what ends up happening is you have created a person 
that may or may not be able to recognize the moral choices that God brought back to you on Monday. So no wonder. No wonder why Josh has said, choose today. Don't wait until tomorrow. You, you, you may not even be able to get the opportunity to hear the sermon tomorrow. Some of you might be sitting here and thinking that, okay, you know, that makes sense what you're saying, but then you start thinking, well, you know, I just don't know if I'm ready. But what did the psalmist say? He said, today, if you hear the voice of God, don't harden your hearts. He's saying that if you don't act on, on the, if you, don't, if you don't act on it, you will harden your heart. If he was talking in modern times, he'd be saying something like this. He'd be saying, don't solidify your neuronal connections on bad choices. It's pretty much what he, what, what he would be saying. And so why were all these people so urgent? Don't wait for a moment. Act right now. Why does the Apostle Paul say that today is the accepted time? Today is the day of salvation. It's because their urgency had nothing to do with the nearness of Christ's return. What it had to do with was something much deeper than that. It had to do with your own person. Who are you becoming right now? And so I'm going to tell you something that you've probably never heard before. God is taking everyone to heaven. Comma. Who would be happy there? So the issue is not, would God take me? Incidentally, according to the Bible, God has already saved me through Jesus Christ. The question is, would heaven be a happy place for you? Because God loves you too much to have you be tortured in a lake of fire. In Ezekiel 33, he says, he, he tells the wicked, turn, turn from your wicked ways. Why should you have to die? He doesn't want anyone to die. But it comes down to the choices that you are making. So you have two choices. Life with God in heaven or death. Romans 3 tells us the wages of sin is death. And so we have to make our choices, the little choices, the medium ones, the big ones, even the extra large ones. <coughs> and so you pray to God for him to be with you, to be by you, to be in you and to guide you. And so you begin to make these right choices, and we need to be thinking about this. This is what God wants us to do. He doesn't want us to suffer. He doesn't want us to die. You aren't always going to make the right choice, though. But as you begin to make a larger percentage of right choices as opposed to the wrong ones, not by your own power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, right. if we give him permission to work through us. And so if this is true neurologically, and everything that Dr. Beauregard said was true, when you mix that with the spirituality and what the Bible says, and with God who is helping you make the right choices, and you begin to make the right choices, and before you know it, you almost don't even recognize yourself. And some of your friends don't recognize you. But not because of, in a negative way, but, but in a positive way. My friends don't recognize me anymore. In fact, my friends really don't even like to be around me because I don't do the things I used to do with them. But that's okay. And you're going to come to the point, you're not going to feel like you're perfect because you will never feel like you are. Because the closer that we become, we, we grow to, the closer that we grow to Jesus, the more faulty and defect we see ourselves in our own eyes. Right. And so you never have that sense of arrival of perfection. And, you know, there's some people who think they've been in the church for 50, 60 years and they feel like they've arrived. <sighs> Give me a break. <laughs> I mean, th th think about this. How long can you approach infinity? People are saying they've done it in 50, 60 years. We're still going to be growing closer even when we get in heaven. And so God is infinitely holy, infinitely good, and infinitely holy or loving. And so you're going to be walking with him for the rest of eternity. And so... We're here and we're pressing on, on making choices. We make choices every single day. And the choices that you make today create the person that you will be tomorrow. Who do you want to be tomorrow? Do you want to be the person that will be happy in heaven? Do you want to be the person who will enjoy being blessed? Because some of the choice, if we want to be happy in heaven, we're going to have to make some choices that's going to make us sometimes unhappy here on earth. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. 
And so if we suffer a little bit here in heaven, we're going to have eternity of pure bliss. So do you want to be the person who will be blessed? There are only two kinds of people in the end. We know them as sheep or goats, wheat or tares, saved or lost. It just comes down to that. The people who look up to God and say, God, your will be done. And then we have those who choose to God and say, thy will be done. Which one are we going to be? So beloved, we are Seventh-day Adventists. And I'm proud to be a Seventh-day Adventist. And this message is really geared towards younger people because when is it easier to make new choices? When you have 50 years of momentum built up? No. You don't want to wait until you have 50 years to start making better choices. I'm sure a lot of people can agree to that. You know, there's older people in this church who I'm sure are struggling on, what to, uh, on making right choices because the choices that they made when you know, they were 18, 18 years old are affecting them today. And so to all the younger people out here, and this is to myself, it's like we need to start making the choices now because it's going to get much, much harder the older we get, the longer we start making these not-so-good choices. And so God can change you. So why wait? Why wait for 50 years to start making better choices? Why wait until you have a whole battery of bad habits? You know, do you have any idea how many people leave the church thinking that they'll come back someday? Most of those people don't. It's rare if they do. And so I want to make an appeal to you today as I close here, especially for the young people here. Some of those who have these neuronal pathways, some of, some of you have these pathways that even now at 19, 20 years old, or even younger, you just walk up and down these paths, just super easy. You just don't even think about it. It's so easy. You turn on the computer, boom, you're looking at bad sites. That's the pathway. Some of you might be choosing to hang around people who drink or do things or say things that you shouldn't, and the next thing you know, you're drinking and you're partying. That's a choice and a pathway that you've taken. So some of us have become so accustomed to talking about bad people that instantly when an, a certain name that's brought up, we just start to instantly revert to thinking bad things about them or saying bad things about them. Other times we become so caught up in, in gossip that we just can't get out. See, we think, Mike, you were saying this earlier, see, we, we think a, a lot of addictions have to do with heroin and smoking and alcohol. But an addiction is a repeated action that you make over and over and over again. And so you're coming to the Spirit of God, and you're saying, by the way, can you hear the Spirit talking to you? You know, li listen, he's speaking to all of us here. The Spirit of God is telling you something. Don't harden your heart. You're looking at the path before you right now. You've been taking this path for a long time. But God says, hey, you know what? Take this path. And you think, ah, that path is going to be hard. I, I don't know if I can do that. But you know what? God's going to be there right with you. He, he's going to take you through it. It's going to be difficult. Jesus never said things are going to be easy. So you th think about this. Pay attention to this. This whole time you're just fighting through this path on your own. But we have the creator of the universe who is there right with us. And so a lot of us make our lives unnecessarily difficult. Many of us have entrapped ourselves. But the good news is that you can unbound yourself. That doesn't mean that those old habits are just going to go away. It means that you have a battle. You have a struggle. And so that is why Joshua said, don't wait until tomorrow. Choose today. And so as you leave today, you have the decision to make choices throughout your whole entire day. And there are going to be times when we make wrong choices and that we fall. But what are we supposed to do when we fall? Get back up. It has nothing to do with perfection. It's all about trust and taking our Savior's hand and relying on the perfection of the Spirit of God to guide us closer to Him. Amen. And so I'm going to make a very specific appeal right here. The Spirit of God has spoken to someone here today. I know He's spoken to me. Someone who has walked up and down this path that they've been going through their whole entire life. This easygoing path. And today, God is going to tell them today that today is the day that you begin a new path. And whatever that may be, you're going to leave the old one here at church. And so you're going to leave that path by the grace of God, and you're going to leave it right here. And you're going to walk out of this church today. And you're going to take your hand in the hand with Christ. 
who died on the cross and who wants to save you from your sins. And you're going to say to the Father, Father, you brought me here by your grace. And I'm going to leave this sin, this struggle, this path right here at the altar. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of your salvation. All right. Let us uh, have our closing hymn. I think we already sang, are we singing joy, joy to the World or are we singing a, Joy to the World? Okay. 125.